They call him the first king of Rome, a man so enveloped in mystery and intrigue that historians even today cast doubt over his existence at all, or at least the stories behind his legend. Many believe that it was Romulus who established some of Rome's oldest customs and institutions, none the least of which included the legal system, governmental policy, and even religion itself. While there are surely some embellishments of Romulus's life, it's hard to distinguish what was fact and what was fiction. Many myths have since been spun about the founder of Rome, some of which even ascribe to him as being a god amongst men, some even identifying him as the Roman god Quirinus. In order to tell Romulus's story, we must first look at their grandfather, Numitor, the once king of the ancient Latin city known as Alba Longa in Italy. Numitor wouldn't stay king for long though, for he was usurped by his brother, Amulius, who even murdered Numitor's son in the process. He kidnapped Numitor's daughter, Rhea Silvia, and condemned her to become a Vestal Virgin, a sort of ancient priestess who was sworn to celibacy. However, Rhea Silvia rejected Amulius's orders, and either through some divine conception or through outright rebellion, Rhea Silvia became pregnant. Contemporary stories indicate that Rhea Silvia was impregnated by the god Mars, and due to this, Amulius had her imprisoned. When Rhea Silvia gave birth, she delivered twins, a boy who would become known as Romulus and his brother, Remus. But Amulius was not about to let these boys live, given their legitimacy to one day challenge him for his throne, and because they were a product of Rhea Silvia's disobedience and a symbol of her undermining of him, so he ordered the twins to be thrown into the river Tiber. The servants tasked with carrying out this horrible order though were stricken, and so instead of throwing the boys into the river, they left him in a basket on the river bank of Palatine Hill, a place that would become dubbed as the nucleus of ancient Rome. The story goes that a she-wolf stumbled upon the twins and that she tended to them, suckling them until they were one day found by a herdsman named Faustulus. It is with Faustulus that the boys grew up with, and would become shepherds amongst other hill folk. In their adult years, the boys, now men, would come across a conflict between King Amulius' followers and those that were still devout to Numitor. It is through this conflict did Romulus and Remus learn of their true origin, and that they were once destined to become kings. Having learned the truth, Romulus and Remus worked together with Numitor's followers, and they were able to overthrow and kill Amulius before restoring their grandfather Numitor to the throne. It's shortly after this do Romulus and Remus set out to establish their own city, a city that would become Rome. They returned to the site that they had been left at when they were infants, but neither of them could agree on which hill should host the new city they intended to build. When the brothers could not come to an agreement, they began to fight, and eventually, Romulus killed Remus. In other tales, it is one of Romulus' followers who kills Remus, and in another more rare tale, Romulus went against his brother's will and began building a wall on one of the hills. When Remus found out, he laughed at how small the walls were and proceeded to leap over them to demonstrate their incompetence at keeping invaders out. Angered by this disrespect, Romulus struck down Remus, perhaps a message to everyone that he would not tolerate insolence, not even from his own brother. In an even more wary telling, Remus is actually killed by Faustulus, the same man who had found him as a baby over a disagreement that led to Faustulus beating him to death. There is a more tragic account regarding Remus's death by the Roman poet Ovid, where after discovering the site of Rome, Romulus prayed to the gods Mars, Jupiter and Vesta to protect the land and engraved a line in the ground which defined the boundaries. Unaware that this prayer had been made, or even that the boundaries had been decided upon, Remus crossed the boundary line and was immediately struck down by Remus's henchman, Sella. The founding of Rome is usually attributed to the date of April 21st, and was commemorated in the imperial period of Rome as being Rome's birthday. The event was known as Perilia, but before that, it's understood that Perilia was actually a festival in honour of the god Pales, the patron of shepherds and sheep. It was on this day did Romulus finish building the basis of Rome, and unlike many other leaders, he did not assume kingship. Instead, 
he sought the approval of his followers to become their king, and with the help of Numitor, he received their blessings. Romulus received a crown, and afterwards prayed to the god Jupiter after a sacrifice, where he received many blessings and favourable omens. For taxation and military purposes, Romulus actually divided his people into three tribes. Each tribe was supervised by an official, and each tribe would be further divided into certain wards, wards which would receive portions of land from Romulus. It's understood that each ward was responsible for providing 100 foot soldiers, a unit known as a century, as well as 10 cavalry and various taxes. Of these military units, the cavalry, which was said to be around 300 in total, would become known as Solaris, or the Swift, and would form the royal bodyguard. But Romulus didn't stop just there. He also took 100 men from leading families and established the Roman Senate. These men he named Patre, or the City Fathers. It was their descendants who would become known as the Patricians, who would become one of the two major classes in the society of ancient Rome. The second class were known as the Plebs, or the Plebeians, and they were more lower class in the sense that they consisted of servants, fugitives, and captives of war. It goes to show how progressive Romulus was in his thinking, that he'd give fugitives from neighbouring civilizations and captives of war a place in his society, knowing that their contributions could encourage the growth of the city. He would establish asylum for fugitives and war captives, and even allow them to claim Roman citizenship. The civilization that Romulus had cultivated was lacking of one thing though, single women. While the population grew, single men outnumbered the amount of women. There were no laws allowing for intermarriage between Rome and its neighbouring communities as a result of their reluctance, and though appeals were made, Rome was ultimately declined because the neighbouring communities did not want to have a potential rival that could seek war with them. Without single women to marry and produce babies, the city of Rome looked like it was doomed to eventually fail. Until Romulus had an idea. An absolutely diabolical idea. It is remembered as the rape of the Sabine women. Other pronunciations of the Sabine include Sabine and Sabina, but for the sake of this video, we'll be going with Sabine. Romulus announced the grand festival and invited everyone in the neighboring cities to attend. Many did, but none so much as the Sabines, an Italic people who lived in the mountains of Italy, who were said to come to Romulus's festival in droves. At some point during the event, Romulus gave the signal and just like that, any suitable women were snatched off their feet and raped. There exist versions of this tale that Romulus and his men were not rapists, and that they were far more gentlemanly in their approach, and that they seduced the women and had consensual sex. Other tales suggest that Romulus was diplomatic in his approach, appeasing to the women with promises of free choice and rights for all women as well. Either way, the neighbouring cities were not pleased with Romulus's conduct and prepared for war against Rome. But the Sabines took too long to get ready, and the neighbouring Latin towns took to action without their Sabine allies. Romulus, along with his men, took to the battlefield and overcame every army that they were met with, killing many on the battlefield whilst absorbing many into their own society, usually the family members of the women they'd stolen or courted. By the time all of the Latin armies had been defeated, the Sabines were ready, which is a shame for them because it could very well have been possible to have defeated an infant Rome with all of their combined forces. But alas, the Sabine leader Titus Tatius had waited until all of his forces were assembled before advancing them upon Rome. The battle was said to have been bloody and hellish, and both sides suffered heavy losses. The winner of the conflict was not determined because during the final charge of Romans against Sabines, the Sabine women interposed themselves between the two armies and brought the waves of the battlefield men to a pause. During this moment, the women were able to convince the armies to lay down their weapons and come to a peaceful resolution. It's out of the Sabine women's intervention that Romulus and Tatius were able to come to terms of agreement which would see the pair of them rule the same community, at least for the time being. The two kings would preside over the growing community for a number of years before Titus Tatius was slain in a riot in the ancient city of Lavinium, where he had gone to pray to the gods. The death of Titus Tatius would see Romulus become the undisputed ruler of the community that was far larger than when he would first drawn boundary lines in the dirt. 
The next few years would see Romulus commit to the expansion of his lands and forces by not only expelling raiders from nearby settlements, but by going to all-out war against cities that posed threats against him. He besieged entire cities, captured towns, lured armies into ambushes, and when he couldn't take central cities that he was gunning for, he ravaged their countryside instead. All in all, Romulus and the city of Rome had become a force not to be taken lightly. Romulus's reign lasted for 37 years before he was said to have died, though like his life, much of Romulus's death is shrouded in mystery and accounts of the supernatural. For one, he was said to have simply disappeared in a whirlwind during a violent storm. Roman historian Titus Livius, better known as Livy, provided a far more realistic idea that Romulus was murdered by ambitious senators who wanted to take Rome in a different direction, or that he had been murdered by his peers out of sheer jealousy. Levy, however, also believes that Romulus had been so powerful that he had ascended to heaven, chosen by the god of war, Mars. With this notion in mind, that was shared by many ancient Romans at the time, it allowed for the expansion in Romulus's name, for many believed that to be like Romulus would also incur the favour of the gods, as Romulus had incurred for himself. Let me know what you thought about the first edition of Roman History Explained, and let me know what legends from ancient Rome you'd like to see here next. Until the next time guys.